What's happening everyone, Nick here once again with another TV Box review. It's been a while since Tanex been featured on this channel and today I got my hands on one of their latest models called the Tanex W2A. This model runs on the Amlogic S905W2 chipset on the Alice UX interface. So up next is my full review, demonstrations, benchmarks, pros and cons, along with availability and pricing. So don't go anywhere, that begins right after this quick unboxing. Welcome back. So in the box is your standard TV box contents. So these include the W2A model itself, one infrared remote, one HDMI cable, a 5 volts 2 amps DC power adapter, and a user manual. Its design consists of a plastic body with the Tanix branding on its surface. For IO, it has one HDMI 2.0 port, one non gigabit Ethernet LAN port, one optical audio, one AV port, its DC power socket one USB 3.0, one USB 2.0, and a micro SD card reader. It features an LED display at the front, and its base features four anti-skid rubber feet with no ventilation holes. Its boot-up process takes approximately 30 seconds from an off position, and once completed, you are presented with the Alice UX interface. Now, the Alice UX interface is one of a kind, and you will not find it in any other branded model, as the interface is either patented or copyrighted by Tanix. So this version of Alice UX was built on the Android 11 mobile version, and unlike the leanback launcher, it features a left main panel and a pop-out recent apps panel. It can be navigated fully with a direction pad as well as a mouse pointer. It does not have a navigation bar or status bar, nor does it have a split screen function or drag and drop shortcuts. However, it does have root access, so I'll attempt to install the menu button alternative navigation bar in just a moment. So it's running on the mobile version of Android 11, and you have full access to the mobile version of the Google Play Store and Play Services. This means you have access to your app purchases and save the game data on your Google account. Because it's the mobile version, usually when installed on an Android box, you don't get features such as Google Widevine Level 1 and HDCP protection, a requirement needed for apps such as Netflix and Prime Video to play in HD and 4K resolution. Make no mistake, these apps can work on this box, but due to the lack of Widevine Level 1 and HDCP HDMI encryption protection, the resolution will be restricted to 480p resolution only, even if you are paying for an HD subscription. So if you are looking for Netflix in HD or 4K with Dolby Vision, then I suggest you choose a box running on the Android TV version with full Google certification and Netflix ESN license such as the Homatix Box R 4K. See the link in the description. So as mentioned, those who like to use a mouse cursor to navigate their launcher, the Alice UX interface does not have a navigation bar to facilitate that function, so I installed the menu button alternative navigation bar as a replacement. The bar installs OK, however, due to Alice UX having its own recent apps feature, the recent apps feature on the menu button navigation bar does not work, all other features are working. So let's now have a look at its system and hardware information. So here is the model of the mainboard, but unfortunately I tried to get the 4GB RAM 32 or 64GB internal storage model from the sponsor, but all that was available for review was the 2GB 16GB model. So this model has 2GB of DDR4 RAM and 16GB of internal storage. The Bluetooth version I would want to assume is 4.0 or 5.0 because suspiciously that information was totally left out. 
As already stated, the CPU is the Amlogic S905W2 and it's a quad-core Cortex-A35 processor clocked at 1.8 GHz configured in 32-bit mode, which means it can only run 32-bit apps in games. Its display and graphics are powered by the ARM Mali G31 graphics processor with open GLES version 3.2 support. Its network adapter supports dual band 2.4 GHz plus 5 GHz Wi-Fi. Here's its Android operating system information and it shows that it has root access. Its GPU has Vulkan support API version 1.1. For operating temperature, it has an idle temperature of around 60 degrees Celsius and will monitor how high it increases during gaming. And for decoding of video and audio, it comes with all the decoders for the playback of 4K HDR videos such as H.264, HEVC, AV1 and VP9 decoding. For surround sound audio, it has Dolby Digital, AC3 and DTS HD. There is no Dolby Vision EAC3 and Dolby Vision decoders in this list. So, with these specs, the firmware is able to produce a display of up to 4K 2160p at 60Hz. You get HDR display and it features an adaptive HDR feature that only activates HDR when needed and it's not always on which can affect non-HDR TVs. It can display up to 12-bit 422 color space. It has built-in screen rotation to portrait mode, reverse portrait and reverse landscape. However, this feature requires your box to be restarted to change the orientation. It has HDMI CC options. The option to enable and disable surround sound audio. It has screen saver and energy saver options. Under Advanced Settings is where you can find a root switch, a stationary hardware monitor overlay switch, and a USB device mode. I'm unsure of its true purpose. All I know is that when I enable it, I cannot read any device via USB. And finally, it comes in 54 various languages. The YouTube app that comes pre-installed is the Android TV version, but it has some issues, so I encourage you to either uninstall it or update it using the APK Pure App Store. A better option would be to install the mobile version from the Play Store. Once updated or installed, you can enjoy YouTube videos in 4K 2160p with HDR. Aquarium 4K Video Ultra HD Beautiful Coral Reef Fish Sleep Relaxing Meditation Music Starry Sky New Song 601 watching, live, one of 20 or more. The box comes with the official version of Miracast and surprisingly it works, unlike other models where it fails to connect. The app is developed by Wi-Fi Alliance and requires certification by the box owner and it can cast Android devices in HD quality, unlike Google's default casting feature that only provides 480p. If you would like to customize your launcher experience, instead of using Alice UX, you can install any alternative launcher of your liking. Here I installed one of my favorites called the ADW Launcher 2, which grants features such as long-click menu pop-ups and drag and drop shortcuts. You can also change the wallpaper depending on which app you install. Most wallpaper apps will not work. I found that the only one that does is the AMOLED wallpaper app by 7fun. However, it does not change the wallpaper on Alice UX and you cannot install live wallpapers. To confirm that the screen rotation works, I set it to 90 degrees and restarted the box. It rebooted into portrait mode and here you can see the interface is in vertical mode, but the main panel is not responsive, meaning that it does not change its resolution to suit the new aspect ratio. You can also get reverse landscape where the entire display will rotate 180 degrees upside down. However, you don't get reverse portrait to face the other direction. 
For those who would like to enable or disable root access to work with their special applications, it comes with a root switch. The good news is that it's an instant root switch, so you don't have to reboot to switch between modes. So as seen in the system and hardware information, it comes with an array of decoders for 4K video playback. So here I have it connected directly to my 4K HDR Dolby Vision TV and I'll play a few videos to test its playback capabilities. So this is an HDR10 video. Next we have a 4K AV1 video. This is a Dolby Atmos Dolby Vision video and you get video with no audio as it lacks Dolby Atmos EEC3 and Dolby Vision decoders. Here is another Dolby Vision video. This one has audio as it's not encoded in Dolby Atmos but it only displays HLG and not Dolby Vision. This video is encoded with HDR10 Plus and you get video with no audio. And finally, this video is HLG. So it failed to play audio from some of the 4K formats such as HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision and it also struggles with some surround sound audio. When connected to my AV receiver via HDMI pass-through configuration, it could only output Dolby Atmos, Dolby Digital Plus, and Dolby Surround. In spite of having all the DTS decoders, it could not decode any DTS formats. So this is Dolby Atmos and Dolby Digital Plus, and it plays without issues. This is Dolby Atmos the world's first object-based cinematic audio. Powerful moving audio that transcends from channels to moving around you with pinpoint accuracy. This is DTS HD Master Audio and the receiver only displays PCM, which means it cannot decode the DTS format. This is a Dolby Vision video and the receiver detects and displays Dolby Surround. This is Dolby True HD and you get video with no audio with the receiver displaying no format. This is DTS-X and the receiver displays PCM, so it's not decoding the format. So in the end, it can only output Dolby Atmos, Dolby Digital Plus and Dolby Surround. I tried various media players and the results were the same. For users of the Core Alec operating system, you can install it via SD card or USB using the S4S905W2 2GB DTB from the device tree folder. For those who are new to Android boxes and don't know what is Core Alec, the best way to explain it is to picture the Kodi media player as an operating system utilizing 100% of the box's hardware resources and it's separate and apart from Android. Some of the benefits of Core Alec on this box compared to Android is that you get to play all the 4K HDR video formats including HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision videos that had no audio under Android.
the full surround sound audio, you get all of the formats including DTS HD Master Audio, Dolby HD, and DTS X that was missing under Android. So Koolek is a great 64-bit operating system alternative for playing 4K and surround sound formats. However, it's not a good replacement for Android as it cannot run Android apps and games. For Bluetooth connectivity, I connected my Bluetooth gamepad and I'm quite impressed with how quickly it detected my device and paired it. The connection is also stable and very responsive. So moving on to gaming and heat management. The reason for requesting the 4GB 32 or 64GB model was so that it would perform better with Android gaming and all other functions. However, this is the 2GB 16GB model and where resources are concerned, it's not enough to deliver a good gaming experience. Here I'm running an easy to render Android game called Real Racing Tree and it struggles to render smooth graphics due to its limited resources. Its temperature during gaming maintains at around 74 degrees Celsius, which in my opinion is okay given its lack of ventilation holes, and I would recommend you keep an eye on it if you intend to play Android games. For those who would like to know what app I'm using to overlay the CPU's temperature, it's called CPU Temp. A link to this app can be found in the description below. So to conclude, let's look at some benchmarks and where it ranks on my chart. First, it's RAM and internal storage. Its average RAM copy speed is 3243 megabytes per second. Its internal storage has an average read speed of 110 megabytes per second and a write speed of 29 megabytes per second. With a Samsung 1TB M.2 SSD adapter connected to its USB 3.0 port, it has a read speed of 33 megabytes per second and a write speed of 24 megabytes per second. Next is its Wi-Fi and Ethernet LAN speeds. Based on my internet speed of 154 Mbps, its 5 GHz band achieved the maximum speed of my network. The 2.4 GHz band averaged around 40 Mbps, and its LAN port is not a gigabit LAN port, which means it's limited to 100 Mbps, and in this test it averaged around 93 Mbps. In benchmarking, it's S905 W2 CPU. The Geekbench 5 CPU benchmark registered a score of 99 single core and 297 multi core. These scores are low scores and it's attributed to its 1.8 GHz clock speed and its low RAM and internal storage. In benchmarking its GPU's performance, it really struggled in the 3 Mark Gamers benchmark, registering only 177 in the Wild Life Test, with a very low FPS of 1.06. This also confirms that this model is not suitable for gaming. And in the comprehensive Antutu benchmark version 9, it got a score of 70,555. So I've entered the scores on my TV box rankings chart, and the Tanix W2A currently ranks at the time of making this video at position 95, a position determined by its Antutu benchmark score. However, despite its many features, it only achieved a 3 out of 5 star rating due to its inability to render critical video and audio formats. If you would like to view this chart, I recommend that you view it on a desktop monitor or laptop where you can maximize it and compare various benchmarks and features, a link to which can be found in the description directly below this video. In summary, if I were to order this box, I would go with the 4GB, 32GB or the 64GB model. The specs on this model restricts it to basically streaming movies and TV shows.
The Alice UX interface and its firmware features are great, but I would have liked to see a navigation bar and status bar included. The good news is, this model is so cheap anyone could afford it at a price point of only $23. With that said, that brings to an end today's review. Special thanks to Tanix for sending this model, and I encourage you to support their products as they are one of the more reliable, long-standing developers of Android boxes. In my next video, I have their other Android 12 budget model, so you can look forward to that. If you would like to grab this model at a very low price, I placed links in the description to their personal website and their AliExpress links. And as usual, these links are my affiliate links, which means when you click on them to purchase, I earn a very small commission which goes a long way in supporting this channel and provides the means for me to acquire new and exciting products for review. So thanks in advance for using my links. And to all my viewers, I thank you for tuning in to today's review. Don't forget to smack that thumbs up button to show your support as it really helps with the ratings. If you are just viewing one of my videos for the first time, then I encourage you to click that subscribe button and ring the notifications bell before leaving. This is to ensure that you receive notifications as to when I release new videos or decide to do a giveaway. If you would like to get in contact with me, you can visit my blog at tvboxstop.com or you can email me there directly at tvboxstop at gmail.com. I appreciate the time taken to watch this video, stay connected and see you in the next one.